This is Brandon Martinez of nonalignmedia.com. With the Canadian elections looming in the foreground, it seems appropriate to have a second look at a scandal that broke in March of 2015, which concurrently was swept under the rug. It was reported briefly in the mainstream media, but it was quickly overshadowed by other news, and as is typical of mainstream media, they simply don't follow up on it. They report it once. They have their hand-picked government experts to come on to uh, silence any criticism or deflect suspicion, and then it is simply forgotten and never mentioned again. The scandal I'm referring to was a curious incident that happened in Turkey where a Syrian national was caught trafficking young girls into Syria to join the Islamic State group. This individual was later exposed by Turkish media and the Turkish government as a Canadian intelligence operative on the payroll of CSIS, working out of the Canadian embassy in Amman, Jordan. Wendy, one of the questions has always been, how could these young girls make it into Syria alone? Now it seems they may not have. 28-year-old Mohammed al-Rashad is a Syrian being detained in Turkey. He says he helped the three teenage girls from London step into Syria and into the arms of ISIS. I forget to give you the passport. The shaky cell phone video was reportedly seized from al-Rashad and appears to show him with the girls. This is where the 15 and 16-year-olds transferred to the final leg of their journey. CBC News has obtained a Turkish intelligence document that suggests al-Rashad wasn't just working to connect ISIS with its newest recruits, but that he was also passing information to CSIS. Turkish agents write he said he worked for Canadian intelligence, traveled from time to time to Jordan with tickets purchased by the intelligence service, and shared the information he'd gathered at the Canadian embassy. That's where he received his marching orders. A report in the Ottawa Citizen tells us that, quote, Canada's embassy in Jordan, which is run by Prime Minister Stephen Harper's hand-picked ambassador and former top bodyguard, is linked in news reports to an unfolding international terrorism and spy scandal. The federal government refused to comment Friday on multiple Turkish media reports that a foreign spy allegedly working for Canadian intelligence and arrested in Turkey for helping three British schoolgirls travel to Syria to join Islamic State militants was working for the Canadian Embassy in Amman, Jordan. Reports also say the suspect has confessed to working for Canadian intelligence and was doing so in order to obtain Canadian citizenship. The man previously traveled to Canada with the Embassy's approval, said one report. Canada's ambassador to Jordan is Bruno Sacomani, the former RCMP officer who was in charge of Har Stephen Harper's security detail until the Prime Minister appointed him almost two years ago as the envoy to Amman. So what we have here is a direct connection between the government of Stephen Harper and an ISIS recruiter who was on the payroll of CSIS. Now what does that tell us? That tells us, one, that a man who was working with ISIS was also working with CSIS as if this is a symbiotic relationship, as if there's almost no consequential difference between ISIS and Western intelligence. Now, if the fact is that this person was just spying on ISIS, then why did he allow those schoolgirls to make their way to Syria unimpeded? He didn't try to stop them. In fact, he, if it wasn't for this CSIS agent, those individuals would have never reached Syria. So this is a direct facilitation of ISIS activities. This is not some sort of rogue operation where they're trying to gather intelligence on how ISIS works. This is directly aiding and abetting ISIS. Now, when confronted with this evidence, the Harper regime does what it does best, and that is to deny, deflect, and remain silent. ...stated that someone working for a foreign intelligence agency has been detained for attempting to assist three British schoolgirls in joining ISIS in Iraq. Reports allege that the person being detained was working with Canada. We heard that the minister is aware of these reports. Is Canadian intelligence involved? And why are there persistent reports from the Turkish media on this?
Thanks again, Mr. Speaker. I am aware of these stories, and as uh, you know, and as the members know, I do not comment on operational matter. Uh, we are only fully aware, Mr. Speaker, that uh, I uh, risk a traveler or traveling and willing to uh, join terrorists. That's why we are uh, putting on the floor of this House Bill C-51 that will better uh, give tools to our law enforcement and police officers to prevent a Canadian from a commit terrorist act abroad and coming here and uh, being a bigger threat to our country and our safety. Their silence is an indicator of their guilt. Now, in and of itself, it might not seem like much, but what this incident shows is a broader pattern of Western intelligence complicity with ISIS, a clandestine relationship, a cooperation between Western intelligence agencies and the group calling itself Islamic State. So on the surface, while Western politicians saber-rattle against ISIS, declare their opposition to ISIS. This is nothing more than political theater, a bluster to disguise and cloak the fact that ISIS is in fact nothing more than an extension of a Western intelligence covert operation to do its bidding in Syria to fight the government of Bashar al-Assad. As nothing more than an errand boy for the United States and Israel, Stephen Harper's agenda is to lend whatever support he can to the covert campaign to overthrow the government of Syria. And this has manifested in the form of Canadian intelligence helping to recruit people to join ISIS. Now all of this brings into focus the curious and suspicious shooting that took place on October 22nd of 2014, the Ottawa shooting, where a gunman has supposedly killed a Canadian soldier in front of the Ottawa War Memorial and then stormed Parliament. This made-for-TV event bears all the hallmarks of a false flag black operation orchestrated by the government of Stephen Harper to rubber stamp his involvement in the U.S. campaign in Iraq and Syria. The suggestion that this event was not foreseen and could not have been prevented is simply a fantasy. In fact, the Canadian intelligence agencies and police were running all kinds of war games, drills, mimicking what later took place. You've dealt a, a lot with security officials, and you, are, you know how they have been preparing for these kind of situations. What can you tell us about that? Well, I can tell you that they may have been surprised by the actual incidents, but not by the concept of them. Within the last month, we know that CSIS, the RCMP, the National Security Task Force, all uh, engaged in, uh, I suppose, they ran a scenario that's akin to a, a war games exercise, if you will, where they actually imagined, literally, an attack in Quebec, followed by a, an attack in another city, followed by a tip that, hey, some guys are coming back, some foreign fighters are coming back from Syria. So they were imagining a worst-case scenario. We're seeing elements uh, of that happening right now. But they were trying to figure out, in the event of that worst-case scenario, how do we maintain the integrity of the investigation? Who's in charge? You know, who calls the shots? Who does what? Who calls whom? So that is what they were trying to do. So this, people may talk today in terms of being surprised, but we know this precise scenario has been keeping them up at night for a while. The alleged shooter, Zihaf Bibo, was a drug addict and a criminal, well known to police and even well known to the intelligence agencies who had been monitoring him for months before the shooting. All of this was pretty obviously manufactured by the regime to rubber stamp the neocon campaign in the Middle East to destroy Syria under the pretext of fighting ISIS, and at the same time to pass anti-terrorism laws which significantly bolster the intelligence services, the police state, and take away our civil liberties. The proposed legislation, which gives the government dictatorial powers, Bill C-51, was already written before the October shooting and was simply plucked off the shelf and railroaded through Parliament by Stephen Harper. It needs to be said that none of this is surprising. It is a prototypical expression of the utterly subservient nature of Canada to the Zionist agenda. Canada exists to serve the interests of Israel before anything else, and Stephen Harper has made that clear on plenty of occasions. This show begins with a quiz. It's about Israel and one other country. 
and your job is to guess which one. Ready? Here we go. In 2006, when Hamas won democratic elections, this country was the first to cut all aid to the Palestinian Authority. In 2009, during Israel's attack on Gaza, the UN Human Rights Council passed a resolution condemning the attack. This country was the only one that stood with Israel in that vote. When Hugo Chavez expelled Israel's ambassador over the Gaza attack, this country said that it would take over representing Israel in Venezuela. All right, which country are we talking about? If your guess was the United States, you would be wrong. The correct answer is Canada. In the past four or five years, Canada has emerged as Israel's most fervent supporter on the international stage. When it comes to policy towards Israel, particularly under Conservative Prime Minister Stephen Harper, the government of Canada has given up any pretense of neutrality and has very publicly picked one side. Let me tell you, friends, our government believes that those who threaten Israel also threaten Canada. We have stood with Israel even when it has not been popular to do so, and we will continue to stand with Israel just as we have said we would.